I come from a far, far away place called Honolulu. <laughs> and I love Maui. I'm delighted to be here. And one of the reasons is there's a ton of long-lived people in Maui. And as a geriatrician, someone who works with the aging population, and as a, as a gerontologist, someone who studies aging, it's kind of like a paradise. All of Hawaii is. It's the longest-lived state in the Union. So I've been here for 12 years, and I never want to leave. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned about healthy aging and longevity over the last couple of decades from the Okinawans, a ton of them here, probably a few in the audience today, as well as other long-lived people. I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who here would like to live 100-plus years? If you want to live 100-plus years. Okay, let's see if we can do one better. Who, if they could be healthy and vibrant, extend their youth span, climb up Haleakala Mountain at age 95, swim in the Maui Ocean at age 100, play with their great, great, great grandchildren? <laughs> That's the kind of healthy aging and healthy longevity that I want, too. The challenge with aging is we don't understand a lot about it, and it tends to be the biggest, it is the biggest risk factor for chronic debilitating diseases. There is a famous person way back, I think, in the 1930s. I don't know if anyone's old enough in the audience to remember the 1930s. Probably not, but um, unless you're Okinawan. <laughs> He said aging is not for sissies. And that's true. It's tough. It's tough to age. But there are people who do it very well. This gentleman I met when I was a young and energetic medical student at the University of Toronto in the 1990s. This man is 105 years old. Yeah, of course, he's Okinawan. He's an Okinawan Canadian, and he was the oldest man in Ontario, Canada at the time. He's surrounded by his, or got, uh, his 90-something-year-old young wife. He married a younger woman. She said the secret was all the healthy foods that she fed him, all these healthy Okinawan foods. I said, well, at that time, I was, you know, I was in Canada. I was not so familiar with Okinawa. I didn't know the difference between someone from Okinawa and Oklahoma. But I wanted to find out. So I went to Okinawa, and I, I got inspired by this man. I thought, you know, this guy's living proof that it's possible to live 100-plus years and be healthy. My first clue of that was when I tried to get him into our study in Toronto. He lived in the back country in Ontario. I said, I called up, and I got his wife, Emmy, on the phone, and she said, oh, he's not here. I thought, oh, God, it's 105. <laughs> is, he in the, is he in the hospital? Is he OK? Oh, yeah, I'm just very sorry. He's out fishing. <laughs> I said, OK, I'm going to find out about those Okinawans. So, I actually was lucky enough that my twin brother, I do have a twin brother, he also loves to study aging. He's an anthropologist, so he's more like, I'm more the serious one, he's more on the wild side. But we're identical, we share a lot. And we went together, as, he was a graduate student and I was a medical student, we went together to Okinawa and we met Dr. Makoto Suzuki, who was the head of the Okinawa Centenarian Study, which is now the longest-running study of 100-year-olds in the world. Over a 1,000 centenarians have been studied. That's pretty impressive. Until you realize there's a lot of centenarians in Okinawa. You can't walk down the street without bumping into one, so it wasn't that hard to recruit them. But I'll show you one of the very first centenarian visits that we had in Okinawa. This is what we do. We crash into the centenarian's home, Track her down. There she is. And she looked young and vibrant. And we do physical exam. That's me doing the exam. That's my twin brother on the left. She had no heart murmur. Her heart sounded great. One of the keys to healthy age. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Nick wouldn't tell me that. Nick wouldn't tell me that. Now look at the difference in height between the generations here. You can see that there's a reason, at least possibly some nutritional clues to why the Okinawans live so long. You're not small like that from osteoporosis. You can get that way, obviously, but a lot of small Okinawans in that generation, because they ate fewer calories, a very plant-rich diet, over a kilogram of vegetables a day. Well, that's a lot of vegetables. 2.2 two pounds, right, in a kilogram. <laughs> Now, not just a lot of longevity outliers in Okinawa, but all around the world there's more and more centenarians. But this lady, Madame Jean Camon of France, is the biggest longevity outlier of them all, lived 122 years. Yeah, that's a lot. At 115, she was riding a bicycle. She knew Van Gogh. <laughs> oh, wait, is that a centenarian? Oh, no, no. That's a naked mole rat. It really is. Not naked because he doesn't have his Bermuda shorts or his shirt, but because he's got no hair. See, look at that, no hair. They live underground, they don't need a lot of hair, but they are a longevity outlier. Yeah, they are. They live a long time. How does the, long does the average rat live? Yeah, a couple years, two or three years. This guy lives 30 years. <laughs> Unbelievable, it's true. And they don't get cancer. 30 years, they're just like people that can live a long time and delay or avoid the diseases of aging, what we all want to do. So we study them, not our research group, but our colleagues do. Now, what about this? This is, this is the island of St. Helene. That's a tortoise, 68. That's pretty good for a tortoise. It's a long-lived animal. Now, that's the year 1900 up there. Now, this is the same tortoise over 100 years later. Look, he's not even moving around at 68, but 176. <laughs> He looks great. Maybe that's the secret, sleep all day. <laughs> I want to look like that when I'm 176. <laughs> well, maybe not exactly like that, but you know what I mean. Now, this is a long-lived fish, 200 years old. A rock fish can live 200 years old. That one is a youngster. That one, I couldn't find a picture of a 200-year-old fish. That one's 115, so still not bad. Trees can live a long time. They're living beings. That tree in Norway, it's a spruce tree, almost 10,000 years old. Now, I'll show you the winner here. That's a hydra. We live in the, near the ocean, right? A hydra is a polyp-like creature that lives forever. Yeah, unbelievable, isn't it? They continuously regenerate their stem cells. As long as they're not eaten by a fish or a shark or something, they will continuously go forever. So what's common about these long-lived organisms, these everything from humans to trees? Is there a common mechanism for aging? Well, turns out there is. We share a lot of genes. You can see the percentages with various creatures that are studied in biology of aging studies. Those two creatures on the screen up here, they're my creatures. <laughs> my daughter and my son, age six and age four. They share 100% of the genes. We all share the same genes in this room, and we differ by 0.1%. That's all. That's what makes us different. It also impacts how long we live. Remember from biology, there's four DNA letters, right? A, T, C, G. Remember? They spell all of our genetic code. And you just string those letters together, and you get genes. And we get one from our mom, one from our dad. If you take a single letter in a single gene and engineer it into a yeast or a mouse, or another what we call model organism of human aging, 
it will live a lot longer, be more metabolically efficient. It also gets physiologically smaller. Now, these gene variants, I'll call them, they occur naturally in the human population. Maybe you have a gene that has a thousand DNA letters, and there's a single different one between you and you. Maybe 20% of you have one version, eight, and most of us have the other version. That one single letter can result in double the odds of us living to be 100, or triple the odds if you have one of those from mom and one from dad. Who do you think has that letter in this picture? <laughs> well, interestingly, these letters occur all through the, the uh, model organism, the animal kingdom, but we search for years in humans to find that a letter that corresponded to those mice or, or worms or fruit flies, and then nothing until 2008 when our research group at the Kokini Medical Center Honolulu Heart Program and the John A. Burns School of Medicine, Department of Geriatric Medicine, our group, we study aging and gerontology, geriatrics, and we found a single letter change, a G letter. If you got a G letter instead of a T letter, you had double the odds to live to be 100. If you had two letters, triple. This fellow, Chuck Yogi, he lives over on the Big Island. He's in our study. This guy, I'm pretty sure he has one of those single letters. He's got over 20 world records in track and field. This is, this is at 89 years of age. His mom lived to be 100, his dad 98. That's 200 years between them. I'll bet he'll be up there, too. Now, it's great if you got one of those letters, you live a long and healthy life, but what about the less fortunate who don't have one of those letters? Well, it turns out that our genes are not just sort of inert pieces of DNA that just sit there and don't do anything. They do a lot of stuff. They control not only do they affect how long we live, but you know, the, uh, how much we weigh, how we process food, all kinds of things. And there, it, it, this gene that we found, this FOXO3 gene, it's called, it's a stress resistance gene. It gives you more resistance to stress. But if you do a little bit of stressful things to your body, it appears what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. If you do a bit of exercise, it turns on the gene. Gets, you, get, gets the gene making healthy proteins. It's a stress resistance gene. You can also stress the body, interestingly, it's kind of like a micro small stress by eating certain foods that turn on this gene. And this gene is ahead of a big network of other genes that impact all of uh, the aging of the body. That's my brother outside his house in Okinawa. My brother Craig, he, he loves sweet potatoes. That's not an ice cream truck, that's a sweet potato truck. <laughs> no wonder the Okinawans live so long. Now, eating fewer calories is a mild stress on the body. This is a study done at the University of Wisconsin on aging rhesus monkeys. For 20 years, one of these guys has been eating 25% fewer calories. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> yeah, the, the guy that looks healthier. And he has aged more slowly, less disease. Turns out the, the experimental group that ate just fewer calories is living a lot longer, too. I don't know if he's happier, but <laughs> he's living longer. Now, we can't all eat 25% fewer foods. I don't want to eat less. I can tell you, you know, I'm not calorically restricted, but I am trying to eat healthy foods. So scientists in aging are now working on these foods called caloric restriction mimetic foods. Mimetic. They mimic the effects of caloric restriction because they've got healthy compounds in them. Some of them are right here in the Hawaii diet. Okinawan sweet potatoes, green tea, turmeric. Look at the last one, chlorophyta. Those are algae that produce astaxanthin. Turns out if you stress the algae, they produce all this anti-stress hormone called astaxanthin. It's a plant hormone. Now look at prednisone. Look, that is the body's, that's a drug mimic of your body's cortisol, your anti-stress hormone. You get stressed, this hormone gets turned on, fight or flight, you know, and it protects you against stress. Unless you take too much of it for too long because drugs like that can cause osteoporosis, stomach ulcers, but there's natural plant stress hormones, like curcumin uh, from turmeric, astaxanthin from seaweeds, 
Patekins from Green Tea, these are under active investigation to see how they can be used to decrease inflammation in the body, which is a major driver of aging. Caloric restriction mimetics. Now, there's other technologies under development right now that we can do uh, in, in animal studies and are starting to do in human studies. There's a, there was a study published not long ago where, where scientists were able to uh, markedly improve the eyesight of unfortunate children that were born with a genetic defect that made them blind. So you could splice in the gene correction into a virus. And viruses are hijackers. They go into your body, they hijack your DNA, and they make copies of themselves, and then eventually they die because the body figures out what's going on. Well, you can use an inert virus, put in this corrected gene, it'll go into the genome and make and fix the problem. And hopefully someday we can fix problems with things like macular degeneration, a major cause of, of age-related blindness. Stem cells. We can use stem cells now. A lot of experience going on with stem cells to correct, say, aging heart defects. You have a heart attack, your tissue's dead. Rather than having a heart transplant, go right in there, fix the cells. Nervous system, fix the aging brain cells. Immune system, fix those cells. So there's a lot of things that are coming down the pike that could help us all age more healthfully. But what about all of us who are already <laughs> halfway or three-quarters, excuse me, the way there, that are, is there hope for us? This, I'm going to end the talk soon with a message of hope. It's never too late. So this is from a study that we did just recently in the Honolulu Heart Program at Kuakini Medical Center, where we took uh, over eight, uh, we have, a, like I said, a study of over 8,000 American men of Japanese and Okinawan ancestor that we followed for almost 50 years. It's one of the best studies of aging in the world, and it's one of the studies that brought me right here to Hawaii to work. Now, if you look at this slide, you can see that this is a population survival curve, and everyone's alive in the beginning of the study. It's a bunch of healthy 70-year-olds, and we said, okay, let's look at the guys in the study that avoided major risk factors for disease and disability as you age, like hypertension, high blood sugar, unhealthy diets. So if you just had the right numbers, what would it do? Well, that's the best you can do right there. By the age of 90, if you, you can see that about 60% of that, that population is still alive, but dropping off, dropping off, every time you add one of those risk factors, the, the survival of the men dropped off. Until if you had five or more, you only had half the chance of living to be 90 and being healthy. So there is a lot you can do if you just do the simple things. Eat a healthy diet, exercise, go see your doctor for your preventive exams. And finally, this is a message of hope for all the, the kids and the people who want to be kids. If you live 107 years, like Mr. Nakamura here on his 107th birthday, you could probably eat all the cake you want. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.